Hello, Grandma here, and I'm reading The Hiding Place, and today I'm going to read uh, the chapter called The Watch, which is chapter four, The Watch Shop. Uh, if you'll recall, uh, the Tin Booms are watchmakers, and um, their, their first floor on the main street is a watch shop. Uh, they they live above the shop uh, for two stories above and behind the shop in a in a house that is um, let me let me get the map again <clears throat> here we go uh, in a house that has been attached uh, to their house uh, with the winding staircase right here in between um, but the watch shop is right here, and the workroom for the work a watch shop is back here, with this being their like their living room area, and the bedrooms are all up in here. Okay. I was standing on a chair, washing the big window in the dining room, waving now and then to passers-by in the alley, while in the kitchen, Mama peeled potatoes for lunch. It was 1918. The dreadful war was finally over. Even in the way people walked, you could sense a new hope in the air. It wasn't like Mama, I thought, to let the water keep running that way. She never wasted anything. Corey, her voice was low, almost a whisper. Yes, Mama. Corey, she said again. And then I heard the water spilling out of the sink onto the floor. I jumped down from the chair, ran into the kitchen. Mama stood with her hand on the faucet, staring strangely at me while the water splashed from the sink over her feet. What is it, Mama? I cried, reaching for the faucet. I pried her fingers loose, shut off the water, and drew her away from the puddle on the floor. Corey, she said, Mama, you're ill. We've got to get you to bed. Corey. I put an arm beneath her shoulder and guided her through the dining room and up the stairs. At my cry, Tanta Anna came running down the stairs and caught Mama's other arm. To that, together we got her onto her bed, and then I raced down to the shop for Father and Betsy. For an hour, the four of us watched the effect of the cer cerebral hemorrhage spread slowly over her body. The paralysis seemed to affect her hands first, traveling from them along her arms and then down her legs. Dr. Van Veen, for whom the apprentice had gone running, could do mo no more than we. Mama's consciousness was the last thing to go. Her eyes remained open and alert, lovingly looking at each one of us until very slowly they closed and we were sure she was gone forever. Dr. Van Veen, however, said that was only a coma, very deep, from which she could either slip into death or back to life. For two months, Mama lay unconscious on that bed, the five of us with Nolly on the evening shift, taking turns at her side. And then one morning, as unexpectedly as the stroke had come, her eyes opened and she looked around her. Eventually, she regained the use of her arms and legs enough to be able to move about with assistance, though her hands would never again hold her crochet hook or knitting needles. We moved her out of the tiny bedroom facing the brick wall down to Tante Jan's front room, where she could watch the busy life on the Bortelurestraat. Her mind, it was soon clear, was as active as ever, but the power of speech did not return. With the exception of three words, Mama could say yes, no, and perhaps because it was the last one she had pronounced, Corey. And so Mama called everyone Corey. To, to communicate, she and I invented a game, something like 20 questions. Corey, she would say, what is it, Mama? You're thinking of someone. Yes. Someone in the family? No. Someone you saw on the street? Yes. Was it an old friend? Yes. A man? No. 
a woman Mama had known for a long time. Mama, I'll bet it's someone's birthday, and I would call out names until I heard her delighted, yes! And then I would write a little note saying that Mama had seen the person and wished her a happy birthday. At the close, I always put the pen in her stiffened fingers so she could sign it. An angular scrawl was all that was left of her beautiful curling signature, but it was soon recognized and loved by all in Harlem. It was astonishing, really, the quality of life she was able to lead in that crippled body. And watching her during the three years of her paralysis, I made another discovery about love. Mama's love had always been the kind that acted itself out with soup pop and sewing basket, but now these things were taken away. The love seemed as whole as before. She sat in her chair at the window and loved us. She loved the people she saw in the street and beyond. Her love look in the city, the land of Holland, the world. And so I learned the love is larger than the walls that shut us in. More and more often, Nolly's conversation at the dinner table had been about a young fellow teacher at the school where she taught, Flip Van Verden. By the time Mr. Van Verden made, paid the formal call on father, father had rehearsed and polished his little speech of blessing a dozen times. The night before the wedding, as Betsy and I lifted her into bed, Mama suddenly burst into tears. With 20 questions, we discovered that no, she was not unhappy about the marriage. Yes, she liked Flip very much. It was that the solemn mother-daughter talk promised over the years for this night, the entire sex education which our taciturn society provided was now not possible. In the end that night, it was Tanta Anna who mounted the stairs to Nolly's room, eyes wide, cheeks aflame, Years before, Nolly had moved from our room at the top of the stairs down to Tanta Bep's little knock nook. There, she and Tanta Anna were closeted for the prescribed half hour. There could have been no one in all Holland less informed about marriage than Tanta Anna. But this was ritual. The older woman counseling the younger one down through the centuries. One could no more have gotten married without it than one could have dispensed with the ring. Nally was radiant the following day in her long white dress, but it was Mama I could not take my eyes off of. Dressed in black, as always, she was nevertheless suddenly young and girlish. Eyes sparkled with joy at this great occasion the tin booms had ever held. Betsy and I took her into the church early, and I was sure that most of the Van Verden family and friends never dreamed that the gracious and smiling lady in the first pew could neither walk alone nor speak. It was not until Nolly and Flip came down the aisle together that I thought for the first time of my own dreams of such a moment with Carol. I glanced at Betsy, sitting so tall and lovely on the other side of Mama. Betsy had always known that because of her health, she could not have children, and for that reason had decided long ago never to marry. Now I was 27, Betsy in her mid-30s, and I knew that this was the way it was going to be. Betsy and I, the unmarried daughters living at home in the Bay Area. It was a happy thought, not a sad one, but that was a moment when I knew for sure that God had accepted the faltering gift of my emotions made four years ago. For with the thought of Carol, all shining round with love as thoughts of him had always been, since I was 14, came not the slightest trace of hurt. Bless Carol, Lord Jesus, I murmured under my breath, and bless her. Keep them close to one another and to you. And uh, that was a prayer. I knew for sure that that could have not sprung unaided from Corey Tin Boom. But the great miracle of the day came later. To close the service, we had chosen Mama's favorite hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus. And now as I stood singing it, I heard behind me in the pew, Mama's voice singing too. Word after word, verse after verse, she joined in. 
Mama, who could not speak four words, singing the beautiful lines without a stammer. Her voice had been so high and clear, was hoarse and cracked, but to me, it was the voice of an angel. And we have a picture of uh, Mama and Papa taken so that you can see what they look like. All the way through the sink, she sang, while I stared straight ahead, not daring to turn around for fear of breaking the spell. When at last everyone sat down, Mama's eyes, Betsy's and mine, were brimming with tears. At first we hoped it was the beginning of Mama's recovery, but the words she had sung, she was not able to say, nor did she ever sing again. It had been an isolated moment, a gift to us from God, his own very special wedding present. Four weeks later, asleep with a smile on her lips, Mama slipped away from us forever. It was in late November that year that a common cold made a big difference. Betsy began to sniff and sneeze and Father decided she must not sit behind the cashier's table where the shop door led in the raw winter air. But Christmas was coming, the shop's busiest time, with Betsy bundled up in bed, I took to running down to the shop as often as I could to wait on customers and wrap packages and save father from clamoring up and down from his tall workbench a dozen times an hour. Tanta Anna insisted she could cook and look after Betsy, and so I settled in behind Betsy's table writing down sales and repair charges, recording cash spent for parts and supplies, and leafing through past records in growing disbelief. But there was no system here anywhere, no way to tell whether a bill had been paid or not, whether the price we were asking was high or low, in fact, to tell if we were making money or losing it. I hurried down the street to the bookseller one wintry afternoon, bought a whole new set of ledgers, and started in to impose method on madness. Many nights after the door was locked and the shutters closed, I sat on in the flickering gaslight, poring over old inventories and wholesaler statements. Or I would question father, how much did you charge Mr. Hook for that repair work last month? Father would look at me blankly. Why, uh, my dear, I can't really. It was a Vacheron, Father, an old one. You had to send all the way to Switzerland for the parts. And here's their bill. And his face lit up. Of course I remember. A beautiful watch, Corey. A joy to work on. Very old. Only he'd let dust get into it. A fine watch. Must be kept clean, my dear. But how much did you charge, Father? I developed a system of billing and increasingly my columns of figures began to correspond to actual transactions. And increasingly, I discovered that I loved it. I had always felt happy in this little shop with its tiny voices and shelves of small shining faces. Now, what is she talking about here when she says tiny voices and shelves of sm small smiling faces? Is she talking about people, dolls, or is she talking about watches? But now I discovered I like the business side of it too. I like the catalogs and stock listings, like the whole busy, energetic world of trade. I think she was talking about watches. Every now and then, when I remembered that Betsy's cold had settled in her chest and threatened, as hers always did, to turn into pneumonia, I would reproach myself for being anything but distressed at the present arrangement. And at night, when I would hear that hard, racking cough from her bedroom below, I would pray with all my heart for her to be better at once. And then one evening, two days before Christmas, when I had closed up the shop for the night and was locking the hallway door, Betsy came bursting in from the alley with her arms full of flowers. Her eyes, when she saw me there, were like a guilty child's. For Christmas, Corey, she pleaded, we have to have flowers for Christmas. Betsy, tin, boom, I exploded. How long has this been going on? No wonder you're not getting any better. 
I've stayed in bed most of the time, honestly. She stopped while a great cough shook her. I've only got up for really important things. I put her to bed and then prowled the rooms with new opened eyes looking at Betsy's important things. How little I had really noticed about the house. Betsy had wrought changes everywhere. I marched back up to her room and confronted her with the evidence. Was it important, Betsy, to rearrange all the dishes in the corner cupboard? She looked at me. Her face went red. Yes, it was, she said. You just put them in any old way. And the door to Tante Jan's rooms. Someone's been using paint remover on it and sandpaper too. That's hard work. But there's beautiful wood underneath. I just know it. For years I've wanted to get that old varnish off and see. Oh, Corey, she said, her voice suddenly small and contrite. I know it's horrid and selfish of me when you've had to be in the shop day after day. And I will take better care of myself so you won't have to do it much longer. But, oh, it's been glorious being here all day, pretending I was in charge, you know, planning what I do. And so it was out. We had divided the work backwards. It was astonishing once we'd made the swap how well everything went. The house had been clean under my care. Under Betsy's, it glowed. She saw beauty in wood, in pattern, in color, and helped us to see it too. The small food budget, which had barely survived my visits to the butcher and disappeared altogether at the bakery, stretched under Betsy's management to include all kinds of delicious things that had never been on our table before. Just wait till you see what's for dessert this noon, she'd tell us at breakfast table, and all morning in the shop, the question would shimmer in the back of our minds. The soup kettle and the coffee pot on the back of the stove, which I never seemed to find time for, were simmering again. The first week Betsy took over and soon a stream of postmen and police, derelict old men and shivering young errand boys were pausing inside our alley door to stamp their feet and cup their hands around a hot mug, just as they'd done when Mama was in charge. And meanwhile, in the shop, I was finding joy in work I'd never dreamed of. I soon knew that I wanted to do more than wait on customers and keep the accounts. I wanted to learn watch repair itself. Father eagerly took on the job of teaching me. I eventually learned the moving and stationary parts, the chemistry of oils and solutions, tools and grind wheel and magnifying techniques, but father's patience, his most mystic rapport with the harmonies of watchworks, these were not things that could be taught. Wrist watches had become fashionable, and I enrolled in a school that specialized in this kind of work. Three years after Mama's death, I became the first licensed woman watchmaker in Holland. And so was established the pattern our lives were to follow for over 20 years. When father had put the Bible back on its shelf after breakfast, he and I would go down the stairs to the shop while Betsy stirred the soup pot and plotted magic with three potatoes and a pound of mutton. With my eyes on income and outlay, the shop was doing better, and soon we were able to hire a sales lady to preside over the front room while father and I worked in the back. There was a constant procession through the little back room. Sometimes it was a customer, most often it was simply a visitor, from a laborer with wooden clumpen on his feet to a fleet owner. Now, what do you think wooden clumpen on his feet are? If you know anything about the Netherlands, you know they're famous for having wooden shoes. So I think the wooden clumpen are wooden shoes. All bringing their problems to father quite unabashedly in the sight of customers in the front room and the employees working with us, he would bow his head and pray for the answer. 
He prayed over the work, too. There weren't many repair problems he had encountered, but occasionally one would come along that baffled him. And then I would hear him say, Lord, you turn the wheels of the galaxies. You know what makes the planets spin, and you know what makes this watch run. The specifics of the prayer were always different. For Father, who loved science, was an avid reader of a dozen university journals. Through the years, he took his stopped watches to the one who set the atoms dancing, or who keeps the great currents circling through the seas. The answers to these prayers often seemed to come in the middle of the night. Many mornings, I would climb onto my stool to find the watch that we had left in a hundred despairing pieces, fitting together and ticking merrily. One thing in the shop I never learned to do as well as Betsy, and that was take care about each person who stepped through the door. Often when a customer entered, I would slip out the rear door and up to Betsy in the kitchen. Betsy, who is the woman with the Alpina lapel watch on a blue velvet band, stout, around 50? Oh, that's Mrs. Van den Koikel. Her brother came back from Indonesia with malaria and she's been nursing him. Corey, as I sped back down the stairs, asked her how Mrs. Rinker's baby is. And Mrs. Van den Koikel, leaving the ship a few minutes later, would comment mistakenly to her husband, that Corey Tin Boom is just like her sister. Even before Tanta Anna's death in the late 1920s, the empty beds in the Bayet were beginning to fill up with the succession of foster children who for over 10 years kept the old walls ringing with laughter and Betsy busy letting down hems and pant cuffs. Okay, I'm gonna show you another picture and it is of Corey, Betsy, their father, and some of their foster children. You can see her father in the back row with a beard. And here in the front by herself is Betsy. And over here is Corey. And all of the rest of them are foster children that they took in. And meanwhile, Willem and Nolly were having families. Willem and Tina, four children. Nolly and Flip, six. Willem had long since left the parish ministry where his habit of speaking the hard truth had made a succession of congregations unhappy and had started his nursing home in Hilversum, 30 miles from Harlem. Nolly's family we saw more often as their school, of which Flip was now principal, was right in Harlem. It was a rare day when one or another of their six was not at the Bayet to visit Opa at his workbench or peer into Tante Betsy's mixing bowl or race up and down the winding steps with the foster children. Indeed, it was at the Bayet that we first discovered young Peter's musical gift. It happened around our radio. We had first heard this modern wonder at a friend's house a whole orchestra we kept reading to e repeating to each other and somehow that seemed especially difficult to produce inside a box we began to put pennies aside toward a radio of our own long before the sum was raised father came down with hepatitis that almost cost his life during his long stay in the hospital his beard turned snow white the day he returned home, a week after his 70th birthday, a little committee paid us a visit. They represented shopkeepers, street sweepers, a factory owner, a canal bargeman, all people who had realized during father's illness what he meant to them. They had pulled their resources and bought him a radio. It was a large table model with an ornate shell-shaped speaker and it brought us many years of joy. Every Sunday, Betsy would scour the papers, British, French, and German, as well as our own, since the radio brought in stations from all over Europe and planned the week's programs of concert and recitals. It was one Sunday afternoon when Nolly and her family were visiting that Peter suddenly spoke up in the middle of a Brahms concerto. It's funny they put a bad piano on the radio, 
Shh, said Nolly, but what do you mean, Peter? asked Father. Well, one of the notes is wrong. The rest of us exchanged glances. What could an eight-year-old know? But Father led the boy to Tante Jan's old upright. Which note, Peter? Peter struck the keys at the scale till he reached B above middle C. This one, he said. And then everyone in the room heard it too. The B on the concert grand was flat. I spent the rest of the afternoon sitting beside Peter on the piano bench, giving him simple musical quizzes, uncovering a phenomenal music memory and perfect pitch. Peter became my music student until, in about six months, he'd learned everything I knew and went on to more expert teachers. The radio brought another change to our lives, one that Father at first resisted. Every hour over the BBC, that's the British Broadcasting Company, which comes from England, we would hear the striking hours of Big Ben. That's a very large clock. And with his stopwatch in his hand, corrected to the astronomical club in the shop, Father conceded that the first stroke of the English clock, time after time, coincided with the hour. Father remained, however, mistrustful of this English time. He knew several Englishmen and they were invariably late. As soon as he was strong enough to travel by train again, he resumed his weekly trips to Amsterdam to get Naval Observatory time. But as the months passed and Big Ben and the observatory continued in perfect agreement, he went less regularly and finally not at all. The astronomical clock in any case was so jarred and jiggled by the constant rattle of automobile traffic in the narrow street outside it was no longer the precision instrument it had been. The ultimate insult came the day Father set the astronomical clock by the radio. In spite of this and other changes, life for the three of us, Father, Betsy, and me, stayed essentially the same. Our foster children grew up and went away to jobs or to marry, but they were often in the house for visits. The hundredth anniversary came and went. The following day, Father and I were back at our workbenches as always. Even the people we passed on our daily walks were perfectly predictable. Though it was years now since his illness, Father still walked unsteadily, and I still went with him on his daily stroll through the downtown streets. We took our walk always at the same time after the midday dinner and before the shop reopened at two and always over the same route. And since other Harlemers were just as regular in their habits, we knew exactly whom we would meet. Many of those we nodded to were old friends or customers. Others we knew only from this daily encounter. The woman sweeping her steps on Koningstraat, the man who read world shipping news at the trolley stop on the Grote Markt, and our favorite, the man we called the Bulldog. This was not only because we never saw him without two large bulldogs on the end of a leash, but because with his wrinkled, jowly face and sharp bow legs, he looked exactly like one of his pets. His obvious affection for the animals was what touched us. As they went along, he constantly muttered and fussed at them, Father and the bulldog always tipped their hats to one another ceremoniously as we passed. And while Harlem and the rest of Holland strolled and bowed and swept its steps, the neighbors on our east, that would be Germany, geared for war. We knew what was happening. There was no way to keep from knowing. Often in the evening, turning the dial on the radio, we would pick up a voice from Germany. The voice did not talk or even shout. It screamed. Oddly, it was even-tempered Betsy who reacted most strongly, hurtling from her chair and flinging herself at the radio to shut off the sound. 
and yet in the interludes we forgot. Or when Willem was visiting would not let us forget, or when letters to Jewish suppliers in Germany came back marked address unknown. We still managed to believe it was primarily a German problem. How long are they going to stand for it? We said, they won't put up with that man for long. So now we know who the screaming person was in the radio that they couldn't stand to listen to. It was Hitler. For once, did the changes taking place in Germany reach inside the little shop in Bart Bartel Jurastrat? And that was in the person of a young German watchmaker. Germans frequently came to work under father for a while, for his reputation reached even beyond Holland. So when this tall, good-looking young man appeared with apprentice papers from a good firm in Berlin, father hired him without hesitation. Otto told us proudly that he belonged to the Hitler Youth. Indeed, it was a puzzle to us why he had come to Holland, for we found he found nothing but fault with the Dutch people and products. Oh, the world will see what the Germans can do, he said often. His first morning at work, he came upstairs for coffee and Bible reading with the other employees. After that, he sat alone down in the shop. When we asked him why, he said that he had not understood the Dutch words. He'd seen that father was reading from the Old Testament, which he informed us was the Jews' book of lies. I was shocked. Father was only sorrowful. He has been taught wrong, he told me, by watching us, seeing that we love this book and are truthful people, he will realize his error. It was several weeks later that Betsy opened the door from the hallway and beckoned to father and me. Upstairs on Tante Jan's tall mahogany chair sat the lady who ran the boarding house where Otto lived. Changing the bed sheets that morning, she said she'd found something under his pillow, and she drew from her market satchel a knife with a curving 10-inch blade. Again, father put the best interpretation on it. The boy is probably only frightened, alone in a strange country. He probably bought it to protect himself. It was true enough that Otto was alone. He spoke no Dutch, nor made any effort to learn. And besides father, Betsy, and me, few people in the working class part of our city spoke German. We repeated our invitation to join us upstairs in the evenings, but whether he did not care for her choice of radio programs or because the evenings ended as the mornings began with prayer and Bible reading, he seldom came. In the end, father did fire Otto the first employee he had ever discharged in more than 60 years in business. And it was not the knife or the anti-Semitism that finally brought it about, but Otto's treatment of the old clock vendor, Christophels. From the very first, I'd been baffled by his brusqueness with the old man. It wasn't anything he did, not in our presence anyway, but what he didn't do. No standing back to let the older man go first. No helping on with his coat. No picking up a dropped tool. It was hard to pin down. One Sunday when Father Betsy and I were having dinner at Hilversum, I commented on what I concluded was simple thought thoughtlessness. Willem shook his head. It's very deliberate, he said. It's because Christophels is old. The old have no value to the state. They're also harder to train in new ways of thinking. Germany is systematically teaching disrespect for old age. We stared at him, trying to grasp such a concept. Surely you're mistaken, Wilhelm, father said. Otto is extremely courteous to me, unusually so, and I'm a great deal older than Christophel's. You're different. You're the boss. That's another part of the system, respect for authority. It's the old and weak who are to be eliminated. We all rode the train in stunned silence and we started watching Otto more carefully. But how could we know how in the Holland of 1939 
Could we have guessed that it was not in the shop where we would observe him, but in the streets and alleys outside that Otto was subjecting Christophels to a very real small persecution? Accidental, quote marks, collisions and trippings, a shove, a heel ground into his toe, were all making the old clockman's journey to and from work times of terror. The erect and shabby little man was too proud to report any of this to us. It was not until the icy February morning that Christopher stumbled into the dining room with a bleeding cheek and a torn coat that the truth came out. Even then, Christopher said nothing, but running down the street to pick up his hat, I encountered Otto, surrounded by an indignant little cluster of people who had seen what happened. Rounding the corner into the alley, the young man had deliberately forced the old man into the side of the building and ground his face into the rough bricks. Father tried to read him with Otto as he let him go to show him why such behavior was wrong. Otto did not answer. In silence, he collected the few tools he'd brought with him and in silence left the shop. It was only at the door that he turned to look at us, a look of the most utter contempt I had ever seen. So this chapter kind of fast forwarded to uh, from World, World War II being over to now World War I beginning. Uh, it went from 1918 to 1939. So it was a little bit more than 20 years in this chapter. Our next chapter is called Invasion. And who do you think is invading Holland? Well, we'll find out when we read that chapter. Bye-bye.